Um, I'm really excited and uh, to share with you tonight some of the things I've learned throughout my life. And uh, what I'm gonna present to you tonight though is a life's work. This isn't something that I just started last month or even a year ago. I've been doing this a long time. And so it shows in, in what I do and the knowledge that I have. Um, preparedness for me is a way of life. So I hope that some of you will incorporate that into your lives and it will get better. Um, I have a quote that I like. It says, preparedness when properly pursued is a way of life, not a sudden spectacular program. And um, tonight we're gonna talk a little bit about, I, okay, I listened to Michelle. Her presentation was awesome. And I just was curious, did anybody go out and buy their water and put it under their beds? Yay, <laughs> hands up, okay, that was awesome. She really gave a good overview of the short-term things to store, long-term things, water, um, and then she, tapped, she touched on gardening a little bit. I also am a gardener. Um, I think it just comes with the hat that we wear. And so um, I'm actually, uh, the Square Foot Gardening, if any of you have heard of the, that uh, foundation uh, representative for Southeast Idaho. And so I do enjoy gardening and I teach a lot of gardening classes. Um, I, I'm just gonna put this right out there. I'm not usually good on a camera. I don't, this is a, very uncomfortable for me. I really like to be in person with people. Um, so I'm gonna try really hard to think that I'm, you're all sitting right here in front of me. Um, I'm gonna start a little bit different tonight so we can show you something that you can do. We're going to make some bread with, it has four ingredients and you make it with a fork. There's no kneading required and it, it will be done by the time we finish the class. So uh, what I'm gonna do is let's just mix it up real quick. Let's see, can, can we see? see? Maybe you can just, see. Yeah. yeah, you can see. So I have three cups of flour. I'll make sure that Heidi gets the recipe. Two teaspoons of salt, one teaspoon of yeast, and you just kind of mix it in your three cups of flour. This is just white flour, nothing wheat, no grinding, just out of a bag. So this is super simple. And then we're gonna take, I need to get some water. My kitchen was a good spot since I do everything in the kitchen anyway. So it takes about, with my elevation, about almost one and three fourths cup of water. Did you hear me? One and three fourths cup. And you literally just stir it in until it's incorporated. This is not fancy. This isn't anything special. Anybody, even your kids. You can go back and watch this video because this is all it is. You just stir it in until all the flour is incorporated. Not quite as dry as like a biscuit, but a nice, moist bread. If your elevation is too, if it's too moist, next time add a little bit less water. If it's too dry, just add a, you know, a couple tablespoons more. So anyway, you just mix it together. And then we're just going to cover this. And we're going to, well, I can even take this off. So I have another one here that's been raising. So we're gonna kind of skip this step and go to that one. This is gonna go and it's gonna rise for about two or three hours. So this has been rising. You can't really see it very well. Uh, maybe, can you see that a little bit? It's sticky. Yep. yep. And we're just going to... Oh, will you introduce me so people know why? Okay, I, I forgot. In and out. So my daughter, this, I have five daughters, just so everybody's clear. This is Jocelyn. She's my oldest. And she happens to be here tonight in support of mom. And so she, we're going to be actually interacting and discussing some things. Um, she has a lot of friends that are have large families and they, that are doing some things. And she's really good with stuff I'm not doing as much anymore. I'm cutting down and she's building up. So anyway, we're, gonna, we're gonna take this and we're just gonna pour it out onto some parchment paper. Maybe, you want a special? Yeah. 
just kind of unstick it. So for the 30 minutes that this is going to be, uh, I put the a Dutch oven, a enamel Dutch oven in the oven at 450 degrees. It's warming. This just leaves it over right now. And this dough is just going to sit here and kind of raise for that 30 minutes. Okay, can you see? It's just the dough sitting out here. Okay, that's all we're going to do with that. Yes. We're going to put it in in about 10 minutes. Help me remember, Joyce. I'll watch. Okay. So, anyway, what we'll do is it only takes 35 minutes to bake. And, uh, but anybody can do this. It makes a beautiful loaf of bread in a Dutch oven. You could do it in any kind of a pan that you have a lid on. So, it, it creates a nice hot oven to bake the bread in. Um, there's a little secret technique I'm going to show you at the end so that you can see how to make your crust just perfect on it when it comes out. Okay, so we'll get back to bread. Or get we'll back, go to, back to that We'll later. go back to that in a minute. Um, let's see. So as I pondered on what Michelle had said and what I know about food storage, I decided that um, what we needed to discuss tonight in lieu of what our country is currently undergoing. I'm assuming that you're all listening to the news of some kind. Uh, our president just said a couple day or yesterday or the day before that there are going to be food shortages. And then the second wave was that there's gonna be rationing because people are gonna start buying lots of things. Anyway, it's a mess. And I hope you agree with me on that. <laughs> things are kind of messy at the moment. <laughs> So I think what I'm going to talk about tonight is how to have a great pantry in your home and then to plan your meals and use that pantry to provide for you and your family. So if you don't have a pantry, we're going to build it. Uh, when I talk about pantry, I'm thinking four things. The cupboard in your kitchen that you store items, your refrigerator, your freezer, and then the closet or shelf you have in a storeroom that is your, uh, your feeding the other pantry in your kitchen. This is your storage for adding and doing that. So let's talk about the kinds of things that you would put in your pantry in your kitchen are obviously the foods that you're eating. And one of the first things you need to kind of do is go in quickly and inventory that pantry so that you know what you have know what you can use, what you didn't just impulse buy and it's been sitting there for five years or whatever, because we've all been there, done that. But um, just make an inventory so you know where you're starting. Then you want to pick out some of your favorite recipes. Now, I can give you some ideas of when I had a small, uh, well, a big family, I had five kids, um, and I first started doing food storage, we had a limited budget. I couldn't afford extravagant meals. We ate um, chili mac, okay? It took two or three boxes of macaroni and cheese with a couple pans of chili mixed together and that made a casserole that my family could eat. Everything was pretty much pre-done except for making the, the macaroni and cheese, adding butter and milk. Uh, but that was a pretty easy thing to pull together. Um, we did, how many of you have had like tuna noodle casserole where it's just a can of condensed soup with tuna and you're cooked, you know, uh, egg noodles and that sort of thing. So if you don't have recipes, there's lots of easy things that you can get together really quick and make or use the ones that you have. Spaghetti, how, I mean, every family in America makes spaghetti from a pound of spaghetti noodles and a couple pans of sauce. Um, you can add meat, you don't have to add meat. You can add other things like lentils and beans and we're gonna talk some more about that. Uh, but think about it. I always ask people, their favorite question to ask me is, well, how, how much do I need to store? And when you're looking at it from a recipe viewpoint, how many days in the next month would you like to eat? You wanna eat 30 days? then we need to have 30 meals. You wanna have breakfast every day, then we need to plan something for breakfast. 
Um, I'm not an advocate at this stage of my life for three meals a day. You could probably get by with one or two, but if you have small children, you're probably gonna need to consider three meals a day for a month. So make that plan and um, be able to multiply it. Now, if you have 30 days, you could have 30 different recipes or you could have 15 recipes and do them twice or you could just have a set of seven recipes that you do four times to get through the month. So in the example of the chili mac, if you were gonna have it one day a week for four weeks, then you would need eight boxes of mac and cheese and eight cans of chili. Then you'd need your butter and milk. And we could talk about powdered milk if you don't keep milk on hand. Um, but that was all you'd need. And that doesn't seem too overwhelming in the grand scheme of things. And then you've got a meal, one meal for every month, every week of the month. And you can carry that on with any recipe. Um, depending on how much you're making and the size of your family, one of those days a week can be a leftover night as well, because you don't want to waste or use it for lunches the next day. Um, so you can do something like that. Uh, let's see. When you're starting down the path of going shopping at this particular time, I know I went to the store yesterday on purpose here in Idaho. And I have to say here we have the prices haven't been going up yet, but yesterday they did. Um, we've been kind of, it hasn't really been reflective in our grocery prices until now. Our gas has gone up, but our groceries just until yesterday, and some things I saw anywhere from 50 cents to a dollar per item where things had gone up. So I don't know if you've been watching the prices in your area and how they're going up, but you do need to pay attention. and. I don't think we need to panic, but we need to be urgent in doing some of this in planning and in making a plan so that we have the necessary things to feed our families and ourselves. Um, let's see. Are we gonna talk about some of the things yeah. that um, we wanna make sure we're talking about is that if there's shortages and rations coming at you, that if there's recipes that you're really enjoying, and that your family enjoys how to extend them, how to make a pound of ground beef mm -hmm. go for two or three meals where it used to just go for one. And that's some of the stuff she's gonna teach you as she's showing you stuff from the pantry. But before she gets started on this, um, I don't know if you guys can see not with much detail all this stuff back here behind her, but we did not buy anything to put this display together. And I'm always so proud whenever mom does food storage and prep classes, she doesn't ever go buy anything. This is normal everyday life, and it has been for the entire 37 years I've been on the planet. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're always very proud of how, and her daughters are all like really good at it too. Yeah, they are. <laughs> and no they matter are. where we are all over the planet, even yeah. in Rwanda. <laughs> um, okay, so talking about extending things. So if right. um, you've got, you want to make spaghetti, but pasta becomes rationed that happened during COVID in my town um you know and so you've got a family of nine and you've only got one or two little bags of pasta how do we make that go a little bit further how do we make the beef especially the ground beef go further how do we make a lot of the other things that we are already eating and making just sneak in a few new ingredients that are pantry stable items that then make it so that we can feed more and make our food go further with what we have access right. to. Yeah. Okay. You're so doing great. No, start with that's your fine. Pantry, so. Yeah. So we can start with pantry. Um, so our essential proteins that you can keep um, in your freezer probably or in cans in your pantry would be your beef chunks, your chicken uh, in cans, uh, tuna, salmon all come in cans. You could do your anchovies. Um, there's, oh, we got a bunch. Protein. Okay, spam, I don't know. Some people, I don't eat it all the time. I like it, but it, uh, it's a staple and it lasts. So think about corned beef, hash, the spam. You've got tuna comes in weird packets now. I guess I'm just getting old. I liked it in a can, but <laughs> anyway, uh, Vienna sausages. 
my husband has some fond memories of those. Just reminding you about all the things that we can get in. Uh, I do a lot of bottling. This is Thanksgiving turkey, ham, beef, beef chunks, uh, corned beef. We just had St. Patrick's Day, but uh, this is smoked fish that we caught and, and put in bottles. And then of course, chicken and pork, the normal things. Um, so think about the types of protein that you can eat. It's kind of hard to have this discussion because a lot of people these days have food restrictions. And so trying to make sure you get what you can eat and your family can eat without getting sick is what we all need to make sure that we do. So make sure you get good proteins uh, as far as animal proteins. So, if you're not animal-based, then forget this part and we'll move on to the next. So, well, and there's other, you do have nuts and other proteins. Yeah, we have and nuts eggs and eggs and, and all kinds of stuff. But part of what um, we make sure that people yeah, are thinking, thinking, sorry, is like if you have steamed salmon and a vegetable on a regular basis, you can get shelf-stable salmon and continue probably having a smaller portion, but still being able to have salmon even if things were to shift. Does that yeah. kind of make well, sense? Once your so freezer you're used kind of, to, uh, you, you've used up what's right. in your freezer first. Um, so if you guys eat sausages, that's our 10 minute time. Okay. Um, if you guys eat sausage on the weekends, then having some little sausages. If you, like my family's favorite way to rotate our spam is in our fried rice. Yeah, and Chinese we, rice. sometimes we cook up, chop up ham. Sometimes we have ham flavored spam. You know, so it's it's not necessarily changing just to this, but what are you already doing that you can find a shelf stable supplement supplement or substitute for, for mm -hmm. so that you can have more of it in your pantry sooner, quicker. Right. Then there's your staple of eggs. And if you've got, I don't know how, if you guys are living in the country, if you guys have homegrown eggs or if you're purchasing them from the store, but eggs are definitely something to keep on hand. And eggs will store if they're fresh for many months in your refrigerator. So if you have an extra fridge outside, um, you can use those in your, uh, in your rotation of your foods and the recipes that you want to make. Um, also, I was just learned, you can dehydrate eggs, fresh eggs, and keep them so you just can rehydrate them when you need to. So if you don't have an extra fridge, maybe you have an old uh, dehydrator or something you can use. Um, you can purchase eggs that are already dried uh, or freeze dried. Um, so you can do either one and those work great. Um, I think, Heidi, don't you do Thrive? Yeah, yes. Thrive Life. <laughs> yes. Thrive <laughs> and Control, I have, yeah. I have a lot of Thrive products. They do some nice things and I do have eggs from them. So um, yeah. you can get eggs. And I, I use my fresh eggs for eating fresh, like for scrambled eggs, and then use your powdered eggs in your baking and other things like that, and casseroles and stuff like that. Um, where are you going to go next? I don't know. Let's see. Let's look at this. Oh, let's get the bread in. Oh, okay, so let me get this out of the oven. So we have a very hot to 450 degrees. So you just literally drop it in there, cover it, and we're going to put it in back in the oven for about 30 minutes. And I will get Heidi this recipe. Let's check it at 25. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so while that's cooking, we've talked about some animal proteins. Just to remind you, think about what you've got on hand. That's why you're inventorying your pantries, which would be your cupboard, your refrigerator, your freezer, and see what you've got so you can use it up. Um, some of the essential grains that we can use, a lot of our legumes and things, uh, well, we can do one or the other. Let's do legumes. They can be used to extend your proteins. You want all beans? No, we can. So um, if you've got dry beans, that's great. We're going to talk about how to pressure can here in just a minute. But you can store just about every kind of vegetable or bean that you like. You can go dry beans or you can do canned beans, depending on how quick 
you want things to go. Um, learning to cook dry beans is really quite easy. It just takes a little bit of practice. So um, not practice in a bad way, but just doing it so that you're familiar with the 15 or 20 minutes that it takes and can then use your beans in your cooking. Um, Dawson was talking about extending her hamburger. I use beans to extend like taco meat. How many of you add black beans to your hamburger or a can of corn? Um, sometimes I've add lentils that are cooked because lentils actually have more protein in them than actual hamburger. And so you can actually make your meal go a lot farther by adding a few of these other types of things into your meal. Um, trying to keep vegetables, fruit, and things, and I realize, I understand this is not optimum as far as uh, nutrition in a can, especially our vegetables. Um, home can would be better. Uh, fresh would be best, of course. And that comes along with our gardening if we live in a place where we can do that sort of thing. Um, so anyway, but don't hesitate to get these. These are still fairly inexpensive. Most of these little pound bags of beans are a dollar or less per pound. Um, and, and that pound bag of beans is about the equivalent of two cans, right? Once you cook it up? Uh, no more than that. Probably four. Okay. This is probably equivalent to at least four cans or more of the uh, cooked beans. Um, and so, and these, they're about, well, now you guys have what they call all these, all these there. And so I, I've heard that you can get your vegetables even cheaper than I can in the 35 to 40 cent range. Um, right now, our vegetables run anywhere from 50 to like 65 cents a can for the store brands, not your top brands. But I think they all come from the same factory anyway, so I, would, I don't worry about labels too much. Um, but uh, the other thing real quick while it's all staring me in the face, do you all understand about the best buy dates that are on here and the use by dates? These are all not necessarily for us, the consumer, they're for the people in the grocery stores to know when to put them out on a shelf, how long they can leave them on a display. And it's optimum by that time, but it's good for much longer. And so don't be afraid if it says it's best by today and you think you're gonna throw it out tomorrow. Most of those canned goods will still last for anywhere from two to five years and will be fine. If you notice, a can that's bulging or I mean if this is the common sense stuff if the can's bulging there's a problem just throw it away if you open it and there's a different smell to what's inside throw it away the old adage if in doubt throw it out but otherwise it's still good it may have lost a little bit of its nutritional value the older it gets but it's still very good and so in the situation we're in today I would highly recommend that you think twice before checking out a very good can of something when it's still going to be viable to fill someone's stomach. Because we may get to that point. Do we want to run through these things and just give them quick ideas of how to use every single one? Okay, we can, just the ideas. Oh, okay, spaghetti. kidney beans, you can add to your Italian foods, the red beans, uh, cannonelli, are the other ones that is the white kidney bean and it's the same way. We're kind of, we like to cook at our house and so we use a lot of color in our cooking. So cannonelli beans, if you've never tried them, are good. They're not quite as strong as a red kidney bean, but they're the same, just a white one. Which one do you wanna do? Oh, but lima beans, butter beans are lima beans. They're just a big one, they make small ones. I add these to a couple of different soups that we use and I like them plain, but. The good chilled with salad dressing over them as a side. Yeah, with like cucumbers and tomato yeah, and stuff. Got fresh garbanzo beans. Of course, you've got hummus you can do. What else? A lot of people don't know you literally can drain garbanzo beans and put them in a blender and it makes hummus. Add your garlic, salt, pepper, and consume. And it is like, it's got protein oh, and all like kinds tons, of wonderful yeah. iron and, and different it's things. Super in easy. So you can, you know, you can try that. Put black beans and everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we do. Well, I mean, I would say predominantly Mexican type food, yeah. but it does go in black. I make a delicious black bean soup. Pinto beans, same way. Anything Pinto beans, beans, Mexican in a crock pot 
Um, if it calls for ground beef, you can half your ground beef and add a can um, of pinto beans. beans and black beans. And then all of a sudden you re bulked up your protein and without using the actual meats. Yeah, well, when you think about a pound of hamburgers, 350, and each of these, two of these cans will double your meat and they're, you know, a dollar fifty or less. So you're, it's quite less expensive to use beans as your protein and a lot of them have more. Then of course, refried beans can stand on their own, but they also are great mixed into things. She talked about our old fashioned chili mac. Yeah. Um, you'd be surprised how many kids love that. It's a great grandkid pleaser, kid pleaser. And then small red beans. Red beans. Well, a lot of people buy the Zatarans pre-box things like the, the rice. red beans and rice. That's just a Pinterest, what are the spices and Zatarans, you know, red beans yeah. and rice, and you just, red beans and there rice and some spices, and you're good to go. And then black eyed peas. This is our family favorite with green beans and new potatoes and stuff like that. Anyway, so there's, if you're interested in these beans, you can buy them all fresh. You can buy them in cans. You want to just put it over there? Yeah, I don't know if I, oh, wrong. Oh. <laughs> anyway, uh, but don't be afraid of beans. And um, I bottle a lot of my own beans and pressure cook my own. So if you can do it from scratch, if you have that skill already learned, you can save even more money than buying it in a can already. You want to talk about the tool? We, now or later? Oh, uh, we can do it later. Okay. Okay. Uh, while we're talking about canned things, let's go ahead and talk about the vegetables. So vegetables. Of course, I don't know if you're like me, I would prefer to eat my vegetables fresh, no matter what. So um, do what you can to have a garden as long as you can in your area. Uh, here in Idaho, I think we're pretty similar as far as things. We probably only have about 90 to 100 days of a growing season. Does anybody know how many days you guys have where you are? Shoot, I don't know. Okay, so 90 to 100 days. And when you think about it, that's not very many days that we have from last frost to first frost. Um, so, you know, do what you can. Uh, we have a, what, a chef supply store um, that carries cases of vegetables where you can still get vegetables to bottle. They go to the farmer's markets to buy cases of things to fill the pantry with. Uh, I dehydrate things, I bottle things, and then we eat them fresh. So always be thinking what you can um, store while it's in season. Yeah, store as for the whole season. Corn, of course. I've got some peas here and carrots. We've got, oh, that's more corn. Green beans, spinach. Some of these things, I don't know that Personally, I probably wouldn't eat a can of spinach like this, but I put it in my soup, my Italian tortellini soup, and it's delicious. So whatever, uh, tomatoes. Tomatoes are probably my number one vegetable in cooking across the board. So if you see right now, they've got tomatoes on sale at my Winco for 55 cents a can. And that's excellent. When you look at the cost of tomatoes and then the process of bottling them, I can't almost do it for that price. So having it all done um, is really, really optimum. Uh, getting a good deal. These came from my friend that had extra carrots last fall. So I just got them from her in a big box of mud and carrots and washed them up and bottled them um, for free other than the cost of bottling. So, you know, uh, the, the, the peas, I'm trying to think. I think I actually froze these, I did these from frozen peas. I was cleaning out my freezer and I had too many peas, so I decided I'd get them out of the freezer. It was a, not too long ago, we had a, here in this area, they were kind of threatening with like no power and that sort of thing. So I started to get nervous about having too much stuff in freezers. So I was trying to get as much stuff out of them as I could. And when mom says clean out the freezer, she means make shelf stable. <laughs> so take it from one way to another way. I'd much rather have them frozen as a vegetable, fresh, frozen, and then canned. That's the, that's the choice. Um, okay. Um, let's see, we talked about vegetables. Fruits kind of the same way. Um, I keep, I have, a, you can't see my display. We had to adjust the camera. I, we, I pretty much keep apples around my house all year round. Um, 
And so uh, we always have apples. I buy lots of apples in the fall when I, I have a couple of you pick places. Maybe you guys have orchards there where you can go and pick apples, uh, which is a nice way to do apples. Here in Idaho, I can pick my apples in the fall, leave them in the cases in my garage, and then at about January, February timeframe, when it's five feet of snow outside and we don't want to go out, that's when I make applesauce. Um, usually by the time I get to September for canning, I am tired of canning. And so I don't want to do apples at that time. So I wait and we enjoy them. We make applesauce, apple pie, apple Betty, whatever we're going to make all winter long um, for Thanksgiving and Christmas, so apple strudels, whatever apple, and then I make applesauce. By the time the apples get to that point, they're sweeter, they're riper, and they bottle up beautiful. I always do a nice variety of apples. Excuse me, apple Cindy. Yes. So don't your apples freeze in the garage or is your garage attached so you still have some heat? No, my garage is attached. Believe it or not, in my whole life, I've never had apples freeze until this year. So you can answer both <laughs> uh, So I can answer can both questions. I did it with, I decided to do it early while they were still in a frozen state. I learned so much this winter because and I'll, the, okay, we'll go off on a little tangent, not a bad one. So the apples, I store potatoes, I store carrots and I store onions and a few other random fall vegetables in, in bulk in my garage. Okay. And wow. I've never had a problem ever having anything go frozen or anything go bad. And this year, because our cold temperatures came and stayed for so long, that my garage got down to about 20 degrees and they did, they froze. My oranges fruit froze, but you know what? We thought them for an hour, sliced them and they were just delicious. All of my vegetable, oh, carrots was the other thing that, I mean, it had ice on my carrots. It was so weird, but I, uh, I just scrubbed them and I put them on a pan and we roasted them. I had butternut squash that froze. Um, my acorn squash froze, um, we had sweet potatoes, but as long as they were just frozen and I could still peel them and I- it Technically her whole garage would be taken a big huge freezer. Yeah, it so was a- just went into how to use frozen food mode. Frozen, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know this, so I learned this year. So yes, apples will stay in cases in your garage. I would put them in a fairly, good location maybe close to a door or someplace um but i don't generally have a problem do you guys have deep freezes there for long weeks on end yeah well yeah. in wisconsin we are latitude we're right across from idaho we're straight over uh -huh. but um so what temperature would you say your garage was consistently at other than that deep freeze probably 30 30 to 35 and my apples stay just fine. Okay, thank you. Yes. So, oh, the other thing about my apple sauce that you all need to know is I only put apples in here. There's no sugar of any kind. Or water. It's just, no, or water. It's just straight apples from the Victoria strainer. So I can use this as a substitute for oil in uh, baking or cakes and things like that, you can use this for lots of substitutions because it has no sugar in it, which is nice. Other fruits, you guys have all seen home canned pears and apricots and peaches. You know, when we can't get fruit in season, then this is the next best thing so that we can enjoy it year round. Um, same question I asked earlier. How many days a year would you like to have a piece of fruit? So you decide if you wanna have a half a, a peach for breakfast with your breakfast and some cereal or, or your oatmeal on top. You know, if you wanna have a little bit of fruit, then it's worth the effort. The other way that I store fruit is dehydrated. And I don't know if you can see this. Here's plums, peaches, strawberries, apples, and blueberries. Anyway, I have all of these dehydrated as well, and I can use, I can rehydrate them and use them in desserts 
it, they're great in my instant oatmeal. I make it uh, kind of a Quaker oat, oatmeal packet. I have a recipe. I make them and put them in Ziploc bags with all this dried fruit and my family loves it. My grandchildren love it more. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, we like that recipe is, too. Okay, I'll make sure Heidi, I get you that recipe too. And the thing is, is I store them in a uh, like a two gallon bucket, and I keep the recipe on the side of the bucket, so that. Um, Where's my the one? That yeah, I'm gonna show you. There's one of my tricks to my food storage. This one is powdered milk, and I always keep the recipe on the side of the bucket. So when I decide I need milk, I just grab my shaker bottle. I have the shaker bottle recipe on the back because we don't drink a lot of milk. So I can make just one or two cups at a time and then I can stick this in the fridge to uh, if there's any left over, or I can make a whole quart uh, of milk. And both of the recipes are right here if depending on how much milk I need. We don't actually drink a lot of milk. So this is really handy for me. This is whole milk, full fat, and it's the kind of uh, dried milk that we can use to make cheeses, uh, cream cheeses. What else, guys? You can make any kind of dairy products from it, it from the milk. It's so also that better as a replacement for baby formula. Too. Yeah, and you can use it for baby formula. So we can do that. Um, let's talk about more shelf stable milk. Yeah. Okay, shelf stable milk. She uses more of this than I do. But do you guys have know that the milk comes in these septic? Things. I have seven kids. She has one left at home. So <laughs> I would go through more of everything. <laughs> so almond milk, oat milk, and cashew milk. There's all kinds of milks. And you can get them. Uh, Gosner's in Logan, Utah. They have flavored milks. My grandkids love root beer flavored milk and chocolate milk and strawberry milk. So depending on what you're doing, you can have any flavor you want. I stick with the standard generic ones, but these are so nice. These, I should have put my glasses on. These are good till 2022, but I I'll keep them, them up to five years for after. five years after the expiration date. As long as they're kept in a cool, dark, dry place, then we'll be fine. So Cindy, I have to yeah. tell you, sorry, I keep interrupting everything. Um, so we out here in Wisconsin, I'm in Sheboygan, we're in the Appleton steak and we love Gosner shelf stable milk, but it is huh? so expensive to get yeah. out here. And somebody told me that you could get it at Dollar Tree. Now I ordered it on Amazon. I got the, you know, the, the quartz mm -hmm. it cost, let's see for 12 of them. I think I spent $46. Which is crazy for 12 so yeah yeah it's Woo. crazy now because you know because so then on one of the groups one of my friends said you know what they have it at dollar tree go onto their website and order it because it's not available here which uh -huh. i did and got 12 of them for like 15 dollars that's so, a normal price <laughs> right, exactly exactly so they had whole milk and they had two percent now i do know when you order it from gossner's they have like root beer milk which my grandkids loved they have chocolate yeah. milk strawberry milk cookies and cream or something like that so they do have other options but gossner's actually bar none it tastes it's real milk is what it is it's amazing yes 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 thank you um, if you, if you have an itch to come to Utah or go to Idaho. Utah or Idaho, go, just go buy Gosner's. They're up in Logan. And, um, it's really fun to go to the factory and, and get what they have. Um, other milk that's good to have on hand is your evaporated milk. And you can make your own and bottle your own, or you can purchase it. And it can be, uh, diluted to make a lower fat milk. And then of course your sweetened condensed, which, um, you can also use for different things. Uh, you can make that from uh, powdered milk as well. Let's take some questions. Anybody, does anybody else have questions while we're just going over pantry things? I'm trying to spark your brains for what you need to go get. Anybody feel, else? Feel free to put a question in the chat if you want to, or you can unmute and ask a question. Yes, absolutely. 
Okay, let's talk about fats um, that store well, your oils and that sort of thing. So it's, oh, I'm not gonna say anything bad about this <laughs> um, because it's necessary for some things. And some people, this is what you can afford. So if this is what you can afford, it doesn't last very long in a plastic bottle. Uh, my guess is it won't last maybe six to 12 months past its expiration date before it will go rancid. Now, if you have the jars, um, you can open this, put it in jars and seal it. I can show, I'll show you how to do a hand sealer to take the air out and it'll stay much longer. Uh, but if you leave it in this container, it won't keep forever. Your olive oil and your avocado oils all are pretty much good forever. Um, they won't go bad. Okay. Um, things like sesame oil for your Chinese food. I recently, well, it's been a year now, um, I learned how to bottle butter before the price went up, I will say that. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, so I have about 60 jars now of butter in pint-sized jars, which hold one pound. So this would be equivalent to one pound of butter, and it will store anywhere from about five to seven years, they say. So that's a, a good way to keep butter. Um, I, I used to use margarine when that's all I could afford. I've since learned that my, I would be better to use butter than margarine. <laughs> so I try to use better. Um, having some of your spray oils are great when you're spraying hands. Um, just doing simple things, not necessary. You can totally do it from this, but very handy. I always wonder when, our situation gets a little more, uh, I don't know, concerning. We're, we're a little more stressed. Yeah, emotionally heavy. <laughs> um, you know, that's when we're not going to want to cook or we don't want to do things. So we need to practice some of these things ahead of time so that we can do them without too much thought so that we're not over even making things worse. Or what we're already using and use what we're storing. Right. So this is for pie crust at, at holiday times. Uh, I don't generally use Crisco for anything else other than de uh, my Dutch oven cleaning. Uh, coconut oil, ghee stores indefinitely, and this is uh, bacon grease. I know a lot of people these days say, don't keep your bacon grease. My grandma kept back bacon grease on the stove her whole life, my whole life, and it's just a staple to have on hand, and it will extend your uh, your fat budget by a lot. So keep your bacon grease that you cook and put it in a bottle and stick it in the fridge if you want, but use it when you're frying eggs or frying potatoes or whatever else you're doing to keep on your pantry. We do have some questions now for you to oh, good. while you're in between. What? Um, first of all, what kind of dehydrator do you use? Okay, dehydrator, I have an Excalibur. Um, but I used, I don't even know the name of, you know, the white one that was kind of a rectangle with rounded corners. I had one of those for many, many years. It didn't have temperature control or a timer. It just was on or off. And I still did fine. But now I use, I graduated and I got an Excalibur, which is very nice. It does have temperature control. Uh, I keep most of my things, even my jerky, I dehydrate it 105 or less so that it keeps as much alive as possible. Um, and it has a timer on it, so I can set it for an amount of time. And so I, I get things done a little bit better. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, yeah. now where do you get your two gallon buckets? And someone did say you can get them used from like bakeries, they have frosting comes in them, mm -hmm. but we do buy ours new. Yes, and I just get them local. Um, the Smith and Edwards down in Utah. Has anybody been to Utah to hear of Smith and Edwards? It's kind of an army surplus store. So I don't know if you have an army surplus type store back East, but that's where I get my buckets from. They're a little bit harder to find right now. And some stores have buckets and no lids or lids and no buckets. I think Walmart even carries the two gallon buckets though our Walmarts do. Yeah. If you can get them, it just depends on, find out what day they get their shipment and go on that day. Cause yeah. if they and get check them, them. And if you have more than one Walmart available to you, one may have buckets and one may have lids. So here, um, so 
you know, check and see. Things are a little bit harder to come by. You want it to be a food grade bucket if you're going to put food directly in it. If you're just going to use it for storage, your um, your buckets from like Home Depot and Lowe's will work as well. I use those buckets for my gardening. I do gardening buckets and do wonder buckets and things. Um, but they will work if your food is in another a mylar bag or some other kind of container. I know Michelle talked a little bit about the different ways you can put things in a bag. Okay, then this, you talked about your powdered milk, but they want to know where to get it. Do you still get yours from the storehouse mostly? Yes, mostly I get my milk from the church storehouse. Um, it has an excellent milk. Um, I get my chocolate milk from them. Um, what else? I don't. They just wanted to know where you yeah. had full fat milk that you were referring to on your. Bus. Yes, it it's been from the Bishop Storehouse. And I've had it for a long time because I don't use it a lot, but it's still delicious and it still works just fine. So try that. that. I think they carry the full fat milk on purpose because you can make so many other things with it. You can get a dry milk from the store, but it's not a real milk. It's a milk imitation milk. And so those are not ones you can use. You can use it to drink and put on your cereal or bake with, but it's not going to make other products. It's not going to make butter. It's not going to make cheese and those kinds of things. Okay. So if you are a milk drinker, what is the shelf stable behind, beyond the gauzers? Mm -hmm. Is there other, are there other suggestions on how to create a shelf stable milk flow? We talked about extending milk. Yes, we did. So one of the things you can do to extend fresh milk is, and this is some, if you're older, you're gonna, you're gonna laugh because this is what we used to do back in like the 70s. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, there was a, there must have been some kind of a shortage because I remember my mother doing this, but you would buy a half gallon of milk. You had an old gallon container. You would mix up a half gallon of powdered milk and pour both of them in your whole milk and your, and you'd mix it up and chill it. That's the secret with powdered milk is that it's not so tasty when it's warm. It mixes better in warm water, but if you chill it, then once it's cold, it tastes just like regular milk. And if you'll get your kids used to that, or if you'll get used to that, you won't even be able to tell the difference within a, within a very short period of time. So if your family uses two gallons of milk a week, you can take your, your gallon milk budget budget. in half by extending it with the powdered milk and then you have shelf stable that you're supporting that. Powdered nutrition. milk is right now, I don't know how, how much is milk in Wisconsin? I don't do milk. Somebody else will have to answer. <laughs> and if you get organic. Yeah, yeah if, it's just, organic. if it's just regular milk, um, it's about $2, three dollars a gallon. So during the original pandemic in spring of 2020, I live up in a super rural community um, by Bear Lake, Idaho, um, where we literally have one grocery store for our entire county. Um, now we're ranchers and farmers and whatever, and there's lots of resources, but our milk went up to $5 a gallon. And that was when gas prices were still down. <laughs> so I can imagine that milk prices could go up. So you're you know, being able to extend things um, by adding the powdered milk. Another okay. question somebody had, can you make uh -huh. yogurt, yogurt out of your powdered milk? Yes. In the Instapot. In the Instapot you can. And I'm sure you could other uh, pioneering type ways. You just would have to learn about culture it and make it, but yeah, you could. But with the full fat milk, you can. Okay, so here's, a little secret for your bread making. Everybody pay attention. Take a used Ziploc bag, if you've got one. <laughs> we wash ours and reuse. Where is the paper towels? We rearrange all oh, the my... Okay, so when your bread comes out of the oven, take some paper towels. Cool. Hi. <laughs> we need a bite. <laughs> Lift your bread out. Let's see if you guys can see. I don't know how. Do you to see this how beautiful this is? Oh, it's hot. No, I know. I'm gonna see. Okay. Remember, this is only four ingredients and three hours, and you didn't have to babysit it. You don't need a mixer. She used nothing but a bowl and a fork, and it's like you know one of those pretty six dollar loaves of 
fluffy bread at the bakery. So we're gonna wrap back yes. to why we are showing yes. this a little bit later, but we'll get it steaming for a minute. Yeah, we're gonna wrap this in paper towel and stick it inside this Ziploc bag and close it up almost halfway. Almost close or about Yeah, halfway. about halfway. Okay, and then we're just gonna let this sit for just a minute. Yep. And it will steam inside the bag for about 15 or 20 minutes. It'll actually kind of get moist, but it turns that hard crusty crust. Now, if you're like me, I like that crusty crust, but some people it hurts their mouth or whatever, but it'll make it just moist enough like a fresh French bread loaf of bread and you'll be able to slice it. It'll be perfect. Um, more questions? We're, you know, we're doing good. I think we caught up on questions. Okay, so do you want to Actually, go to? Go ahead. I have a bread question for you. So you cooked it in a Dutch oven in the oven. How would that be over a fire? How would that be in just a normal loaf pan? Any of those would be acceptable. You want to be able to get the Dutch oven heated for about a half an hour before you put the bread in it, and then keep it on your heat source for another 30 minutes. So that would work. Um, so yeah, so you could do it on your a camp chef, you could do it on a campfire, um, you could make a coals on a campfire that would keep the camp, the heat your crock pot. Yeah, you could do Dutch it in a normal out. Dutch oven. I have my Dutch ovens, but they're, you know, for outside. Um, does that answer your question, Heidi? Yes, thanks. Okay. Do you want to talk about the bread in here or do we want to wait Let's for wait. tools? Okay. Let's just go. Are, is this, I guess I should ask, is this being helpful? Is this helping you guys think about things you should keep in your pantries or how you reminding you of recipes that you need to pull out so that you can reuse some of these things? We kind of get in a rut and we don't think outside the box sometimes. So we want you to think about what you can use and what's at your disposal. Every item that you're looking for may, may or may not be available at this time. So you need to learn to expand your thinking just a little bit on items. So once you have a bunch of the basics in your pantry, yeah. I'm going to ask a question to transition for you. Okay. Um, how do we make the food taste good? Okay, we can talk about <laughs> seasoning. This may be, it is as, <clears throat> equally as important to the food itself is to be able to make it so that you'll be able to eat it. So we are a house of cooks. And if any of you are cooks and you like to cook, you know that you need, most of the time you need more than salt and pepper to make good food. You need Mexican spices or Italian spices to actually season your food with to make it taste good. Now you don't have to have them, but it sure will make life a lot nicer if you can. <laughs> um, and I have to tell you, I visited, I have one daughter that lives in Africa and I visited with her one time for about three and a half weeks. And I have to tell you, food fatigue is very real. If you start making food that your family or children or even your husband isn't used to, they're going to be crotchety. I don't want to even say hangry. They're not going to be happy because it, it's very real food fatigue. They want things that taste the same. Um, that's one reason the church actually talks about when, when they talked about food storage, um, but uh, how you should have 30 days of comfort food, foods that you're used to, that your body's used to, that your family's used to, so that everybody can stay eating, resting and functioning well um, and for us that would be seasonings and i do store them seasonings a lot of people buy the little tiny you know <laughs> half ounce little things not me i buy them all big or bigger a pound at a time i have one gallon buckets the same size as this powdered milk bucket full of our favorite spices um, spices don't really go bad if they're kept airtight in a cool dark place uh, you might have to add a little bit more instead of one teaspoon you may have it be a heaping teaspoon or two teaspoons but you can still get the flavor out of the herbs as well as some of us can grow them uh, out in the garden and i refresh 
a lot of things every year, so it works out well. Um, of course, so well to illustrate this, since you, told them about, since you told them about your garage freezing this year, I didn't yeah. know you were going to go there. Okay. <laughs> Talk to them, tell them about how the fact case we had two cases of potatoes that we needed to like eat up before okay. they defrosted. Mm -hmm. And we made Italian, we, I mean, you know, we put spaghetti sauce on potatoes, we put Mexican on potatoes, we did gravies on potatoes, we did uh, like a what are our Hawaiian haystacks on potatoes? Because you can put just about anything that tastes good on a potato, but without the spices, you're just eating potatoes. Yeah, it's true. And just so you know, we're not from Idaho. <laughs> <laughs> so this isn't a potato commercial. <laughs> no, although but we do store potatoes. We do. We do eat it, but you could do this, apply the same principle. If you have rice and you choose to, choose to store rice, mm -hmm. you can cook up white rice and you can make white rice into anything, whatever flavor you put on it. Yeah, rice is a really good example too. So pick your favorite ones, make sure you store enough uh, to get by for a while. I generally restock my seasonings twice a year. I do it just before fall and in this early in the spring because I usually make lots of soups and things in the winter time where I use seasonings. And then I use them through the summertime. I use different ones. So I kind of do half and then the other half to, to bring them up. And so we, our Winco sells spices in bulk. So I don't know if Aldi's does or if you have other stores that sell them. But I know you can get larger containers of Costco Sam's. Costco Sam's, those kinds of places all sell one pound packages of seasonings. Don't hesitate to buy the big ones. Uh, the price per ounce is so much cheaper if you buy it by the pound than by the ounce. I can't even tell you. It's it's really crazy. So be frugal in your spending. Check it out. Um, so why don't we show them some of the spices to help them get thinking about what spices we keep okay. on hand and use a ton. Lemon, of pepper, cheese. garlic, salt. I keep garlic powder and onion powder because I don't use them the same. This is garlic dried garlic bits and onions, but I use fresh onions as much as possible. I'm one of those people that puts onions in just about everything. They're so good for us. Um, and so I keep 50 pounds of onions on hand as well with everything else. Johnny's kosher salt and pink Himalayan salt. Um, they both are good. Kosher salt's a little different. If you've never cooked with it, you might try some. It actually brings out the flavor differently than just a regular salt. Okay, so we're, we're gonna do a pause. Um, for any of you who are taking care of children or have children that you would be caring for in a food storage mode or in a preparedness mode, um, pink salt versus iodized salt. The pink salt is actually a mineral that goes into the body and helps you absorb essential minerals like iron and magnesium from your food. So this actually can make or break whether or not a child could become mineral or vitamin deficient. Just as simple as picking a different type of salt. So I highly yes. recommend pink salt Use for the pink Himalayan salt to be preparedness. Nice pepper. I have pepper grinders too. I use it fresh ground, um, good flavor. Taco seasoning, cumin, Italian seasoning, which I make. I actually, it's fun. I just remember I teach a class on uh, how many of you use Mrs. Dash. And I do a gardening class where we grow all the herbs and talk about how to grow everything and then make your own Mrs. Dash, which is really fun. Buttermilk ranch dressing, which is just a combination of garlic powder and onion powder and a little the bit powder of milk. the powder. So the powder there starting. are tons of recipes for this on Pinterest. Yeah, so you, you can make it your own, 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 own ranch. Parmesan. I mean, parsley. Uh, onion soup mix, if you do, and then soy sauce is another good staple. If you can't do soy, do your Bragg's liquid aminos or your cocoa aminos and some other kind are all equally. You, if you're using a soy, I mean a soy sauce substitute, you already know what you're doing. Um, question. So, those terms, so do the vinegars, talk about vinegar and okay. oh, do we have questions? Yes, Heidi. Yes, um, I know in Michelle's class, the very first video, um, she talked about kosher salt and having a ton of kosher salt. Do you remember mm -hmm. what that was about? Yes, because you can use it in your um, to preserve meats and things like that. If you were if we we're out hunting or if we're trying to salvage everything from the freezer and you're going to need a lot of salt. 
But salt is something where um, you can just take salt or drink salt water to, for electrolytes and to sustain you. So if you're in a situation where you're needing that kind of thing, it's very helpful. It's actually a really fun deep dive. Jump on Pinterest and research, you know, different types of salt and how they interact with the body because your Epsom salts are used for cleanses and detoxes. You know, you've got your kosher salts, which are more for preservation. You know, then your iodized salt does have a place because of how it actually will bring out salty flavors and different vegetables and meats yeah. with bottling and different things. And then you've got your pink salt to help, you know, consume and pull out some of the minerals in our foods. So salt really is quite magic. And our sodium levels is one of the number one things in our bodies that if your sodium goes, you're you're gonna go. Yeah, no energy. Yeah, it's really <laughs> well, not right. just no energy. You can't live without sodium. Salt, salt. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Next thing to have in your pantry is some type of vinegar. Um, now you can just store distilled vinegar. It's good, of course, for lots of other things besides eating. You can clean with it. You can do all kinds of things things with white, but. Uh, I use them for salad dressings, seasonings, um, marinades, marinades for things. There, it's a flavor thing that we don't realize how much is in a lot of store bought food. There's vinegar yeah. in almost all store bought. Food. That's something we recently found out too. We, I guess I didn't realize how much vinegar was in the foods that we already buy, prepackaged foods, and so a lot of that flavor enhancer is from vinegars. And so, if you learn how to use your vinegars, it's really fun. Okay, while we're talking about vinegar, we can do condiments. If, you, if you're a condiment person, then, you know, <laughs> you're going to be fine. <laughs> Make sure you have plenty. Ketchup, mustard, mayonnaise, salad dressings if you want pre-made. Um, there's tons of condiments. It's, I think we live in a condiment world right now. So um, just get the ones you want. You don't have to keep excess of other things, but do the ones that'll make whatever you're eating be better. Um, so then jam is the other condimenty type thing. Yep, jam. And then we're gonna check for questions and then we'll keep going. Okay, so I just, I make jam. I don't buy jam anymore, folks. So any kind of jam, well, I have gone from half gallon, I mean, quart size to cut size. <laughs> size. <laughs> so, cause we don't use as much jam as we used to, but. Uh, you can actually buy frozen berries now almost as cheap as you can get them fresh and you can use those to make your jams at home so you can control either your sugar amounts um, or your substitutes depending on what type of diet and preference you have. Um, questions. Question. Anybody have a question? We haven't had any new questions. So. Okay. So another staple in what's coming up will probably be pasta. Um, they, they did run out already. When toilet paper ran out, I think pasta was number two. So while they still have some in the stores, I would recommend if you're going to use pasta with children or if you like pasta, you need to get a good supply of pasta. Pasta is another thing that extends meat though. It does you can a put lot. It just about anything on pasta yeah. and it adds. So try different kinds. Generally, you can get pasta for about a dollar a pound or less, depending. At our, at our store, I can buy a 10 pound bag of pasta, which is even cheaper than buying it by the pound. So if you have one that you like, and then I just store it in a bucket. I started buying buckets 45 years ago, so I have lots of buckets. So did you talk about having some canned food oh, no. on hand for- Having some purposes. type of prepared meals on hand. These are progresso soups. Whatever kind of soup you like, or something you can open up and eat cold if necessary, or warm and just eat, would be really good to have on hand. Um, if it's just you and a spouse, you could have one of these a week, and it would be really easy to buy and rotate, and they're not very expensive. With a nice slice of bread that was so easy to make, you could have a nice cup of soup and a slice of bread, and life will be good. Well, and if we were living in more of a preparedness vibe, because mom does do a lot of survival training too, um, and we were going to have a day where we were going to do laundry by hand, Ugh. it wouldn't it be nice to have a can of soup that we can open yeah. so we don't have to make soup that day too on laundry day? Yeah, that would be good. <laughs> okay, so okay. you want to go into, you want to do nuts, baking, or 
sprouts. Either or, one. I, I'm not going to go into any more baking. Do you have any questions about supplies for baking? We're talking flowers, sugars, uh, honey. What else? Ma maple syrup. It just depends. Seasonings, you know, your cinnamons, your nutmegs, um, those kinds of things that allspice, whatever kinds of seasonings your family's used to, keep them on hand. Excuse me, Cindy. Yeah. Can, can we please go back to pasta for just a second? Oh, sure. So I don't know what it's like out there for you guys, and I don't understand it. Maybe you guys can can shed some light on it. But our WalMarts, the shelves are like devoid of pasta. A, why is this? And B, um, I actually was able to order some, I don't know, a month ago from, I'm going to say the church, just church storehouse, I believe. It was fabulous because I could, I got a case, a couple of cases actually of the number 10 size cans. I think it was like $35 a case. And I got, you know, six different cases of different things, but the shipping was only $3 and 50 cents, which is yes, amazing. You know, I haven't ordered from the church distribution for so long that I, but I'm aware that they do have a, a flat rate shipping, which is so nice that they offer that as a service to everybody. Yeah, but I so, just don't understand why is pasta, why? Why is pasta it's easy. gone? It's um, easy and children no, like it. Say, why is pasta scarce? Because everybody's bought it. I don't know. Oh, well, it has to do with our wheat and our flour it's, it's too. Wheat. It's coming out. And I think it has it's to do wheat. Where it's manufactured. You can't get wheat. Oh. Yeah, it just depends. We noticed Winco had a lot yeah, of Walmart. We did that yesterday. Well, our Walmart was empty too, but our Winco was, had a plethora of pasta. Cases sitting on the ends of aisles and stuff with big pallets full of pasta. So maybe it's just their ordering system or warehousing or who knows, supply chain issues. They may come and go. So keep checking back and get what you can. I don't think our situation is going to get any better. Um, so we need to just stay on top of it and keep looking and be ready when that they when you get it, grab it. Okay, so well, and then start. as we talked earlier, um, and Carol actually Fontaine just mentioned it too, um, with the Ukraine war and their 25% of the wheat production for the world. Yep. That's going to take 25% of the wheat away from the world. So the prices of things with wheat will start climbing and be more and more scarce. Right. The availability of actual wheat around here even has sort of has really gone down. I mean, we have local farmers. I'm, I'm assuming we'll probably still have access to some later in the fall. But in the stores, it's, I mean, a bucket of wheat the other day at the preparedness store was $59. And it used to be 29. So, I mean, it's really gone up. I, if you want flour and you want to bake with flour, cook your own bread like I just showed you for a few cents compared to buying a loaf of bread in the store, um, you should pick up flour quickly. 25, 50 pound bags, whatever you can manage. Um, even if you just get 10 pounds at your store, get multiple 10 pounds if you can uh, before they put a limit on how much you can get. But I would grab flour quickly um, because I think it's going to probably go away for a time. It may come back, but I can't tell you when. So what's the best, what's the best way to store that? Do you know, if you don't have a container, you can leave it in your bag. Just make sure you close it up. I usually take mine really good so that you can try to keep the air out as best as possible. Keep it in a cool, dark place in a closet uh especially if hopefully you don't have rodents in your house um but if, if if that's a fairly secure environment you'll be fine um i do keep mine in buckets uh, a lot of people have i used to do bay leaves on top you don't have to um honestly i've been doing food storage with my family since i was about 12 years old and i have never had any problems with wheat or grains I think I've had one bag of oats go bad at one time um, that were quick rolled, so they just got rancid. Um, but other than that, and folks, I had 300 buckets. So, I mean, <laughs> I know what I'm talking about when it comes to buckets and they just, I don't have any problem. Be sensible, put them someplace where they're not gonna get pests. Um, if you already have an ant problem, I don't know what kind of you know pests Critters, you guys have. We don't have a lot because we're like you guys. We're cold so much of the year. 
everything dies. So um, we did get a question about how long a 25 pound bag of flour will last on the shelf. And I'm assuming we can answer that in two ways. One is un I was unopened. Say, if it's unopened, it, keep it up off the floor, preferably. Did you hear the question? Heidi, did yeah. you hear? Okay. So um, yeah, if you keep it up off the floor, it will be fine. You could put it under a bed or something, as long as you know you don't have any rodents in your house that will get into the bag. Um, it will be fine. Um, if it's opened, I would you know, roll it down nice and crease it. And I would tape it shut so that it was secure and wouldn't allow other things in. You would probably keep, you could put a few bay leaves on top of your bag after you opened it, if you want it. They have the smell of the bay leaf will deter most pests. Um, but you could leave it in there probably unopened indefinitely, as long as it doesn't get wet. And two, once it's opened, I'd say within a year or two to use it up and you'd be fine. Um, so we have people sharing different ideas on the chat, which is cool that you can go back and read later. Okay. But we want to thank people for sharing along the way. One of the coolest ones I've seen was that they live really close to Amish country, so they can get spices through the Amish, which was, that's kind of How cool. How fun is that? I know, we need to go to the <laughs> Amish country. That would be fun. And then also some of these ideas to put the flour into like smaller five pound type bags and double bagged for storage to help with weed you can. buckets are obviously. I don't have, just so you know, I don't have a lot of faith in Ziploc bags. Even though they're a great temporary storage system, they're not a long-term solution to airtight food. So even double bagging, isn't gonna keep the air out. They just, plastic just leaches the air. It gets in, it gets into your jugs. It gets into your food if you're using plastic as a container. Um, okay. So we're gonna okay. loop back around, say again. Okay. okay, we're gonna loop back around. We were, wait, wait, we were talking about baking supplies. Yes. And we're gonna go on our quick little tangent. There's statistics that say that most, families in America use absorbent amounts of cereal. cereal. And so one of our favorite alternatives is this really treasured hack that changes oatmeal dramatically. Yes, so talk about that. So we, uh, many years ago, we got tired of the same old, same old oatmeal. And so I went on a tangent <laughs> to try to figure out how to make it better. And we did. And what we found out is instead of using water to make your oatmeal, if you use some kind of juice, apple juice, uh, pear juice, peach juice, cranberry juice, um, you won't believe how great your oatmeal can be. So you're just replacing the water with the juice. Yep. And all of a sudden your oatmeal comes alive. You can use the juice from bottled fruit. Fruit, like your apricots or peaches. You yep. can use that, save that water and you can make your oatmeal with it. Adding things like vanilla and pink salt to your oatmeal will change the flavor and make it savory fabulousness. Yeah. Um, Raisins like dry or fruit. dried fruit. Um, and I just put them in my packets now. I also, in my packets, I found out the secret ingredient is maple syrup powder, yeah. which gives you that nice maple flavor. And you get flavor. that on Amazon, right? And I do get that on Amazon. And it that's completely changed our oatmeal game. So try a little bit outside the box and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised at how much everybody just oh. be imaginative my girls love to put a scoop of homemade jam and a and scoop of peanut, peanut butter, butter in their oatmeal and we make pb and j oatmeal so you really can make oatmeal as fabulous as cold cereal with very little effort and it is substantially less expensive because yeah. each of those additives we're talking about a tablespoon well and it's way healthier for you <laughs> well there's that too <laughs> and it'll stick with you for a bit they won't be hungry again in five minutes. Okay. So you're all way down to so any of the extra things. Those are just some more. Don't be afraid to try your lentils, your quinoa, some of your other grains and legumes. Um, they're really tasty. If, if you get tired of rice, you can make nice mixes. Use brown rice. Now, brown rice doesn't store as long as white rice. I buy it in season. So I would buy brown rice in the fall and use it all winter and, and be done with it by early summer because it won't keep with all the oils in it. Um, you can extend it if you'll rinse them with super hot water and rinse off the rancidity. 
You can still use your brown rice. It's not going to hurt you. Um, white rice technically will last forever. So uh, it helps if it's stored well in a bucket bag. It's similar to your flour situation. Just make sure you keep it dry, cool, dark, and closed. The other thing we talked about for breakfast is having pancake mix on hand. And we oh, didn't have any some crusties. Yeah. Um, a week, I can buy 25 pound bags at our Winco uh, pancake mix that's just add water. So you guys have crusties out there? Yes, crusties is excellent uh, to keep on hand for uh, quick breakfasts and that sort of thing. Doesn't take a lot, but oh, we've got some. Anyway, uh, it helps again use up other pantry items because if you've got the pancake mix and you can use your peanut butter, your jam, right. all kinds of things that we don't always think about as pancakey. She's you can tell she has kids, and I'm kind of past the kid stage, so she's keeping people happy. <laughs> okay, real quick, storing nuts as a source of protein, um, walnuts, pecans. What kind of nuts do you guys grow in Wisconsin? Wheat almonds. I don't know, walnuts, okay. Well, pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, you can order from Amazon or Azure Standard, which Michelle talked about. Um, and I order from them as well. They have drop pot spots here. I've been ordering from them probably for, I don't know, 25 years. Oh, okay. so they're, they're a good source. Who um, is that? Azure Standard, Okay. A-Z-U-R-E. And they're online and you can see where your closest drop point is if you go to their website. They have excellent stuff. Okay, let's talk about comfort food really quick. Oh so yeah, a little bit of that stuff to help for emotional purposes. Yeah, I just have just a little bit because we actually cook from scratch most things, but brownie mixes, a little bit of frosting, you know, cookie bags that are cheap when they go on sale at holiday times. Um, comfort food sometimes will be a real lifesaver when it comes to Things, especially if they're not eating food that they're used to, or you know, just in general, if the stress level's high, it can help you know make people sleep better. I don't know, you know, but comfort food is important, so keep that in mind in your pantry. It doesn't have to be at the top of your list, but it is an important addition Does, to the list. I think someone answered that they, they grow hazelnuts. <gasps> hazelnuts. We should. Oh, I love hazelnuts. <laughs> Okay, so one more, well, should I do this one? Or this Does time? anyone have any more any questions? More questions? We're, we're just about through trying to stimulate you in all the different areas that you can have your four-part pantry stocked. Right, questions about that, anybody? I yes. have one more. So um, I had heard recently that, believe it or not, you're just gonna really, really, really wish you had chocolate in your <laughs> food storage. And so even as far as like cocoa powder, yes. How, I mean, I've tried to store chocolate in the past and then it gets that white bloom on it. Supposedly you can still use it, but what do you know about chocolate? I know I store a whole lot of it. <laughs> I store cocoa powder in one gallon buckets. Uh, the new Mylar bags with the Ziploc top, if you just get a pound or two, um, is totally fine. The new cacao powder. A lot of people use it in their hot drinks or making things. We have so many more ingredients in this day and age than we did 25 years ago. Anyway, um, but all of those things, chocolate is important. I do store, you're gonna laugh, chocolate chips, semi-sweet, milk chocolate, dark chocolate, peanut butter chips, butterscotch chips, and white. So, I, we store chocolate. If you if you can get it, even if it's in the bags, find you a bucket from uh, Lowe's or Home Depot, and you can put your bags of chips in there if you can only buy them by the bag and keep them so rodents don't get into them. In a plastic bin, you can yeah. you can put your bags of chocolate into a plastic. Do you guys bin. have these kinds of bins that you can pick up? Yeah, you can put chocolate so how chips. Long? How long can you can you? Store that chocolate. It stays cool, cold cool, forever. dark, and dry indefinitely. Really? Yeah. Oh. The yeah. white film, the white film actually only happens if you freeze chocolate. I think that's and it, it, it comes off in the baking. Yeah, and it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't make it bad. Okay, real quick. This wasn't really on my phone, but we talked about it and we thought it was important. Um, so what these are are 
in your pantry medicinal supplies so if you have pharmaceuticals number one that you need to take you need to make sure you get a good supply of those and have access to those um, depending on what pharmaceutical you're taking sometimes there's a over-the-counter kind of substitute that you might be able to get and stock up on um, you can try that um, i have pain relievers infant and toddler seems like my grandchildren like to come to grandma's house and get sick so i always try to keep things on hand i also taught my girls the time to buy medicine even over the counter medicine is not after you get sick you need to have it on hand so that you don't have to be running out uh, of the house to get stuff um cold remedies seems to be the one that's kind of the most uncomfortable cold and flu type things and then I don't know a household in America that doesn't need a band-aid. So this box is full of band-aids, every shape, every shape, size, and a few cartoon ones. But uh, band-aids are important, a way to keep things clean. Of course, grab your hydrogen peroxide and a few basic things. It's kind of up to you what you want to store, but make sure it's part of your overall pantry supplies so that you're not caught off guard when someone gets sick. When our immune systems are compromised by stress and things like that, you never know what's gonna happen with people. Okay, now, any questions on pantry supplies? You kind of have the idea of how you can get recipes, multiply them, just, it's as simple as, if I want to make it four times, I got to have four times the stuff. So let's talk some more about the buildings, the budget and build the budgeting of building. Mm -hmm. So how do I create room in my existing budget that we're living paycheck to paycheck in? Where do I reach for the little bit more to be able to get four meals of something when I go to the grocery store next instead of just one so that I can be stocking up right now before things are out? Yeah, that's a good question because... Um, especially since the prices are going up very rapidly, that's gonna be even harder to do. So this is kind of a personal um, decision or a personal thought process that you're gonna to have to make. Are there habits in your life that can be given up possibly for a while um, to create a surplus of income? And I'll just examples like, do I stop by the soda shop every day and grab a 48 ounce soda? Or do I, do we eat out two or three times a week is pizza or Taco Bell or something, something that we can skip for a little while and with less expensive options and save that extra money for adding to our pantry and our food storage. Um, cutting back on, uh, um, Things like potato chips, things like prepackaged cookies. I'm not saying pre cut it out. Just cut back, you know, for a period of time. All those things that maybe aren't our best choices for sustainable long-term benefits for your family. Um, but that's personal. So you guys can decide. Um, any questions? Go ahead and give us questions if you okay. have any. We're so, going to talk about how to, what's the most compact way to add maximum nutrition to our pantries. <laughs> yeah, because most of our food that's in our pantries is going to be non-perishables um, that are going to be, sometimes could be old, depending on how long we've been had them in our pantries. We want to have some kind of nutrition to make it all better, <laughs> to give us some nutrition in our food. Um, so sprouting is a really easy way to do that. And um, my family is really used to it. We've done it for many years. Um, there's, I found two different ways. If you're just two or three people or four, these easy sprouters work great. You just literally put your tablespoon of seeds in. It goes inside this cup. There's a little edge. You put water in it, soak it overnight. You pull it out. All the water drains out on the bottom. And then you dump this one out and then you just set it in and you just rinse it once or twice a day, depending on how dry your climate is. Um, and I will show you. There's a ton of sprouts in there. And you'd be really surprised. Kids actually do love sprouts. Yeah. We pre-decide for them that they're not going to, but 
they really a lot of kids anyway, really don't mind them. And um, I buy from True Leaf Market, uh, is where I get a lot of my sprouts. The Baker Creek is also good. There's a, pretty much look for organic sprouting seeds online, and you can find them. Even as your, I mean, Amazon has them. You can get a salad mix that has like broccoli, alfalfa, radish um, mixes. That's what these are, different ones. Um, and they take about three to five days, depending on your climate and your house and outside. They don't need a lot of light. So in our winters that we all share that are nice and cold and cloudy, you can still sprout inside your house. And worst case scenario, we use a what? Quart jar? Yeah. And an old piece of I, nylon. I didn't and have one out, but you can use a quart jar with just a nylon piece of nylon pantyhose that you just cut around there and you just put it allows air in and water out. And I don't remember what the price of my jar on these cute little Well, guys. they used to be about $15 for these is all. They're not that expensive. Well, Amazon now makes a fun thing when you're doing the jar technique that holds your jar. Oh, and it's fine. like seven bucks. Mm -hmm. And it'll hold two jars at an angle so that they drain well. And so if, things you, people if you want done. to just go with your glass jar and get sprouts going, you know, or build a little contraption. It wouldn't be that hard to, you know, cut a board and make a little stand so they can drain. And these are just three to five day sprouts as well. This has mung beans and lentils and other beans. And I just started them a couple days ago. So they're just getting started, but green peas and stuff, and they'll be really yummy. And you wait till the, the sprout tail is as long as the seed. And then you can eat it at any point after that. And you, you try them when they're, you know, five days and six days and seven days, you'll find out what stage you prefer the flavor in because the flavor changes as the sprout matures. Hey, I would say if they're interested in more sprouting and stuff, you do a whole class on that. Well, we can, there's all kinds of things that can be the cutting board in the knife. There's all kinds of things we can do with sprouts. Okay, I'm gonna- Are we taking questions? Pretty. Yes. So I'm not familiar with sprouting at all. So uh -huh. um, to, uh, are you like putting those in a jar? I, I'm assuming you got some seeds, you sprout it, and then you just add it to your regular meals when you're cooking, is that what that is? Yes. You just want, you add it to like a piece of lettuce on a sandwich with some tuna fish, or you can eat it on top of toast with butter. Um, I make pesto. Um, I'll show, I, I do hydroponics. I can take you and show you my garden in a minute, but um, I grow. Did wise, we put them on scrap. Well, you can put the scrap on anything because you only need a tiny little bit, for, and it's because it's a superfood. You don't need that much to be able to help buoy up nutrition. Um, we sprayed it and it's so stuck. I, I think her parchment paper was bad. Um, it's like defective. <laughs> can they see? Not really. Hello. Can you see the bread down there, guys? Can you hear it? Can you hear it? Yeah, we can see it. <laughs> yeah, and Sharon, to add to your question about sprouts, there's a lot of um, restaurants that do sandwiches. They make you pay a lot of extra money for those sprouts. So on sandwiches. And look at how beautiful too. that is. Oh, this way. They're really inexpensive. We can see. Yep. So beautiful, nice hot bread for pennies, really. That's one of those uh, budget friendly things. We spend a lot of money on bread with kids. At least we do. The average loaf of bread is two to three dollars. And this would get you by changing your bread sometimes. I'm sorry you're not here. I would spread some butter on it and share it with you. Um, anyway, anything you can do like the sprouting, and yes, you can just use a jar. You can recycle any jar. You can pop some holes in the top of an old peanut butter jar. Just use glass. And basically what you want to do is fill it, put your seeds in, fill it with water. Let it set overnight on the counter. Next morning, because you've got holes in the lid up here or you've got your pantyhose, you're going to drain it out in the sink. And you're going to fill it up again with water, kind of swish them around, and you're going to drain it again. And then you can just set it in a bowl, just like that, so that the water continues to drain out and doesn't sit on your sprouts. And then you just do that. You drill, fill it up and swish it, drain it once a day till they're ready to go. That's it. 
it's that easy. And there are tons, there's tons of videos on YouTube, tons of information on Pinterest. But if there, I'm sure you can find a link that maybe you could send them with just one-on-one spreading right. stuff. Can we take, can we, can we take that down and we'll just take it in there? With I will us? just follow you with it. Okay. Her. She's going to follow me. I'm going to show you real quick my hydroponics. So you guys can kind of see that of something else that you can do. Um, I've been doing this now for three years. So this isn't something that I just did quickly. You get a tour of the house. All right. Now that we've turned it apart to do this. Okay, so you tell yeah, me when you're perfect. in the square. That's great. So anyway, I've got all kinds of lettuce, spinach, kale, basil. There's sorrel over here. Um, all I've got some new strawberries down here that didn't need pollination. Um, You've been hand pollinating so, your tomato. Yeah, I've been hand pollinating my tomato plant I brought back from California a few weeks ago. I'm not being super successful yet, but I'll probably keep trying. But this is another way to get fresh, organic food into your diet. And you only need a small amount every day to supplement that other food that's filling your stomach to give you the nutrients you need so that you don't get sick. Uh, my daughter that's in Africa, we had that experience with her. Her kids started showing signs of malnutrition and she didn't understand what was going on. Um, and then when she figured it out, of course, she changed things up. But uh, something as simple it, as just some fresh just greens. Something that, just fresh, you know, in your diet all the time, not just overly cooked and stuff was going to be very helpful. And you're going to be really happy that you've done this. Now, you could do this with any shelf. This is just a, like sure a bookcase shelf. shelf. Any shelf that you could attach a light to. I bought my lights on Amazon. And the buckets I picked up at Home Depot. We can talk about more about this, but I want you to see that there are options for growing food inside your house in our colder climate areas so that you have sustainable food type to things year pantry. round to extend your pantry. Yeah. Anyway, okay. I think, gonna... no, I think that Heidi, unless we have other questions, I think I'm finished. <laughs> yeah, I know. I want to know, and I've had some other people ask about hydroponics. So what specific type of lights those are? And those are just any buckets you cut holes in. I know our son did one with PVC pipes and cut holes and different things. So what are kind of the key things you need and, and how expensive kind of is this to start? Okay. If you have a, an apparatus or a shelf, someplace where you can hang a light, you don't have to have one of these big racks. You could do it over um, just a shelf where you could hang something. Um, the lights themselves were around $100 each, and I will get you a link to the ones that I got so that you can go look at them. Uh, these are just five gallon totes from Home Depot, and I just drilled the holes in the top. This is another whole class though, but you put a cup, and because I makeshifted a bunch of stuff, you use rock wool and some pool boppers you cut and use to get the hold one for no, it so I'm you can to, show well might be able to show them. Yeah. so really a youtube video watching a youtube video will be very helpful okay so see this plant see the roots down here maybe yeah. yes anyway yeah so they're inside this is a piece of bopper that keeps it secured down inside the cup and the pool cup noodle. just it's a, a pool noodle Anyway, and then you just keep the, it just floats on top of the water. This is full and this will, doesn't, most of the lettuces one time filled is the life of the plant. If you want to extend it, you can, that's another story, but this is pretty easy to do. This just comes out and you wash it and use it again. Do you seed, so, gr seed grow them or you start with little plants? Uh, I've done both. I'm experimenting with buying some at the nursery. I rinsed off the soil because the nutrients that the plant gets from soil are different than the nutrients it gets from the, uh, the, the water and the minerals that are in the hydroponics. So it takes two or three days for the plant to adjust from dirt to water, but then it goes the other direction and it just starts growing in the water. Not everything can grow in here because I don't have any pollinators. Thank goodness I don't have bees in my house. <laughs> but um, I, There is a variety of, of bell pepper that I found 
uh, it starts with an SH, I can't remember. Um, and we did, uh, what else did we do? Cucumbers. Yes, we did little cucumbers. Um, you know the little cocktail cucumbers you get at like Costco in the bags, mm -hmm. the little short ones? The they don't need, yeah, they don't, need they don't need pollinators. So they don't need to be where there's other insects. Um, it's hard. You got to keep your environment fairly clean. You can't have a ton of like house plants that may have in, been infested with other things because it'll get into your hydroponics. But if you can keep everything pretty bug free, then this is really easy. And I've been doing it for a while and it's not hard to keep it going. Does your water have to be specific? Can it handle the chlorine? Um, yeah, you'll need, there's a little bit of stuff you do. You have to check your water. You can adjust the pH. And then um, we have what we call master blend, which is a hydroponic blend that we get from back east. <laughs> anyway, uh, and um, it's for specifically for hydroponics, but it only takes like, I think it's like seven grams, grams of this stuff in five gallons of water with Epsom salt and a little bit of citric nit uh, cist uh, nitrates. Anyway, there's a little mix, it's super easy. It really is nothing that everyone couldn't be doing, you know, growing at least your own salads at home. Um, I'm kind of a salad, I'm actually from California, I love salad. Anyway, but I like crunchy lettuce. So I've been on the, the path of trying to find the most crunchy lettuce, something that actually has some mm, to it, not just a leafy all the time. So, so um, it's been fun, it's a journey. And I don't have a lack of people wanting my lettuce if I want to get rid of it. So it's not a problem. <laughs> Any, Any other, other questions? questions? Yeah. Any other yeah. questions? And, and there's no way you can poison yourself, right? With all the stuff you're putting in. <laughs> because No, no. <laughs> they're all actually minerals. They're not actually chemicals. They're better than fertilizers even. So yeah, no, it's fine. Better than some of the soils we can grow our food in, if, depending on what you've had in the ground or the things that have been sprayed on your ground. Could we possibly do an added shorter class on the hydroponics? Because I would too, would love to grow my own salad. Um, that would be okay. a cool thing. Okay, I will get the links so that you can see if purchasing the lights and getting the necessary equipment is still possible. I haven't looked for some for a while. Um, so you'd have to do that to make sure you could get everything. But if you could get set up, even with a small one or two shelves, you could totally supplement your whole life. This, the lifespan of a bucket is, is about one month from the time I start with seeds, which are, you know, a few cents, um, to the time it's fully mature is about three weeks and you can harvest it till about six weeks. And some of them you can see we've cut off and they're already growing back, but then you just have to fill the buckets with water. They just have to be refilled. The amount of water in a five gallon bucket will last you about five weeks. So you, it, there's not even watering on a daily basis like your garden. No weeding, no watering. You just set it and it grows. I have my lights on a timer now too, so I don't even have to turn those on and off. We didn't get to the handy break. Oh, I have something I have to show you. You can't leave. <laughs> <laughs> because someone's asking, how do you seal your powdered milk? Which okay. is the answer. All right, here we go. Okay, Let's go. We're going back. I'll show you something that you're going to want to see. It's because we moved everything and then we couldn't see that. Yep, it was in the... Okay, I'm going to try to put you guys back where you were. Does that look about right? Yep, okay. All right, so does anybody have a food saver? Yes. Okay, so in your food saver, when it's plugged into the wall, you can use your hose with one of these lids to seal airtight like you buy in the store a jar. So the, the canning piece is just an extra piece that works. Yeah, with these, are, these are accessories to that, but that's what these are for, is to make sure that you can seal a regular or wide mouth jar. So what this does is if you take the same attachment and you buy 
This is a mechanical for cars. It's brake called bleeder. a brake bleeder. I can send you the link for that also, Heidi. Um, so what you do, you take your seal, same philosophy of canning. You wanna make sure that your ring is clean, your seal is clean. Put it down, put the lid on top. You stick your end of your hose in there and you just literally by hand, and there's a dial gauge on the brake leader that you take it up to a certain poundage or tell you can't pump it anymore. And let's see if I can get this all the way. Okay, listen. Take it off. And this is now sealed. So go ahead and pop it off. So listen. So if you have canning jars, you could put your powdered milk in here. You could put fruit in here. And I know I just opened it. No, I don't need to put another lid on it because I opened it up and I took out a handful of nuts. I just put the lid back on and do it again. And your rubber seal on your lid will work over and over and over. So this is not huge. It would, it's the same idea that say you had to open a whole can of spaghetti sauce and it's just you and your husband and you're only going to use half the jar. Well, in the jar that it came in, we can't reseal it, but you can pour it into a small pint jar and use this on it and it will seal it back up and keep it in the fridge then indefinitely. Sealed again. Bottom. In I have, she, yeah. meant in, she meant not in the fridge, in your yeah, pantry. You, yeah, you could keep it again. Ten, okay, anyway. Ten, 10 pounds is the minimum. The oh. goal is 15 pounds. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, it's not hard. So I'll send you the link for that. And it's, it's really easy. You can think, I mean, all this dried fruit is like that. It has the seals done. I do raisins that way. You could do your milk. Um, I've been recently making my own granola and putting it into jars and sealing it so that it's like sealed cereal. Um, I've got some flax crackers that we put into jars to keep. Um, I do jerky. Um, I've been uh, doing beef and drying jerky and putting it in jars. This will. This is just like store bought. Um, you do shelf oh, yeah. stable cheese. Shelf stable Parmesan cheese that you can put in jars and seal the lids. This has been in here since sixteen. I guess I'll do a sample. I look like I have fingernails. Oh, there it goes. It's still sealed. <laughs> anyway, we gonna smell, smell it? it. Oh yes, it smells like Parmesan cheese. Oh yeah. So it's a really handy thing to have, and it doesn't need electricity. So you know, anything you've got and you want to it. store, it's a handy little thing. It actually stays in my kitchen in the top drawer because I use it so often. Okay, what about I missed this one from a little oh, bit ago. question. Was, how long will honey store? Honey, honey will store indefinitely. It will solidify and go hard. And the only thing you don't want to do is put it in the microwave. What you do want to do is stick it in a pan of water on your stove on low and just let it simmer all day or all morning until the whole jar goes liquid again. And it'll stay liquid for a while. If you don't use it, it will solidify again. And it's not bad, you just do the same thing again. You just heat it up and, and it'll, go, it'll go back to liquid. Honey will never go bad. It's kind of like the wheat in the pyramids. It's, yeah, it will always be good. And if you can get local honey, all the better because it has all of the local pollens that you get that will help with your allergies. More questions? So far, they're just kind of talking a little bit about their food savers and how that works in this. Oh, sweet, do they like it? I do too, but I think this is going to be great when we don't have electricity and we want to still be able to store and preserve things in that environment. So, Cindy, can you tell us? Oh, sorry. But can Karen? I ask a question? Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, so, um, I don't own a food saver, but I can just buy those parts that you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I don't own a food saver either. So, this is all I have. You just, I'll send the links with Heidi. 
to show you on Amazon. I don't, not affiliate or anything. I'll just give you the link. But you buy these. I don't remember. They're like twenty dollars for both of them. And then the brake leader, you have to have both parts. And don't use the one your husband uses on your car. Save this one for the kitchen. <laughs> and then what about any kitchen cookware should we be getting? Oh, thank you. We did want to, I did have them ready. We just can't see them. So does everybody know how to use a pressure cooker on the stove? If you don't, go on to like YouTube and look for a little tutorial on using a pressure cooker. This is going to be invaluable because it takes so little water and it takes such a fraction of the time to cook beans and other things that meat and stuff. It'll cook it tender in a fraction of the time of just boiling a pot on the stove. And it'll be very important. Try to get stainless steel if you can. Um, they have countertop ones and fancy new ones with your Instapots and things like that. But <clears throat> yeah, great until the power goes out. And but so learning a few of these so manual the power things. Goes out, this is what replaces <clears throat> the Instapot when the power goes out. Yes. Has anybody, and crock pot. Yeah, has anybody ever seen a thermal cooker? This is what they call a Saratoga Jack. It's like a large thermos. And what it does is you take and you put your beans or soup or whatever you're going to make in here. Um, it, it can cook bread there. It does everything. But I'm just going to use beans as the example or rice. Let's put rice in here. You put your rice in here. You put it on a heat source. So the campfire or the Coleman or your stove, whatever you've got power to. You put it on there and you bring it to a boil um, for just a few minutes, like two or three minutes, full rolling boil. You put the lid on it, you pop it in the thermal cooker, close it up, and then, you know, four hours later, uh, your rice is cooked, it's still hot, and it's ready for dinner. So the thermal cooker um, holds. It'll hold your heat for at least, I think it only goes down like, oh, now I gotta remember. It's ridiculous. It's like five degrees an hour or something. So if you get it up to boiling three degrees an hour, yeah, it's not, it's very, not much. very much. So if you have two of these, which I do, you could start one at night with your oats and things in it, and it will be ready for breakfast when you wake up. You can, in the morning, start your dinner in here. You can put whole fresh vegetables, meat, whatever and cook it in here and eight hours later everything's cooked and still hot it really is amazing so it's boil once what was the name of that serve. pillow thing wonder wonder oven thing. i don't remember i remember making yes we made them terrible. did you guys ever make those the wonder boxes that's what it was called. that was like a pillow that you put your hot cooked stuff down in it and like had styrofoam in it it was like styrofoam anyway like it's the same bag. it's the same philosophy of thermal cooking so they just made it into an actual unit, which is very helpful. Any kind of thermos cooking is a really good um, investment as far as understanding and you being able to utilize in a grid down situation because you'll need limited sources for heating, you know, a uh, heat source to bring water and things up to boil. But those are fun. Um, did I have anything else that I forgot? No, the, did I forget anything else, Heidi, that I said I'd talk about? <laughs> I think that's it. Does anybody else have questions? Well, good luck. I'm here. I, you're welcome to email me if you need to. And uh, I have a real strong testimony of food storage. <coughs> so I, I'm still doing it. <laughs> To this day, I'll be doing food storage till the day I die, I'm sure. Um, but uh, I wish you all luck and uh, blessings. Uh, go for it. Get her done, because I think you're going to need to uh, act fairly quickly. Cindy, thank you. This has been a wealth of knowledge. So appreciate your time and energy on this. Um, and also before you all go, our next class is in two weeks, because it's our April 10th. It's with Dave Nowak. He's going to be covering everything. Yeah, Cindy's 
knows him, another expert out in that area. Um, actually, the next two classes are in two weeks and then in another two weeks. So in the next four weeks, we have two classes. Um, they're all experts. Dave next time is going to be covering um, light, fuel, sanitation, first aid, tents, clothing, um, wealth of knowledge. And then the final class got moved from May 1st up a week. They needed to move it up a week. So they'll be on April 24th. It's all in the email I sent out this morning. Um, and they are experts. They are regionally trained on the Red Cross, on the like five or six different um, emergency plan teams. They were at the Paradise Fires. They've been down in Florida for the hurricanes. They do training for emergency plans for stakes. Um, and it's just an incredible amount of knowledge as well that we're gonna have them on um, the last Sunday in April as well. So in two weeks and in four weeks are our next classes. So thanks for all for coming. If you do not get my emails, make sure I have your email um, and then you get all the wealth of knowledge. So thank you so much. I'll stay on for a few minutes if anybody needs to chat. Are you okay with me sharing your email? Everybody. Oh yeah. Okay. So I've got, I'm going to share from the MJ Wilson, Cindy's email so that you guys have that. Yeah. Okay. On your chat. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank all you right. everybody. Thanks for coming guys. Say hi, Dee.